Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I've hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. This is our 25th year. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. During our conversation, please send us your questions and let us know where you are joining from in the live chat. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Esther Starobin share her firsthand account of survival with us. Esther, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person. I'm happy <clears throat> to be here and to share my story and my family's story during the Holocaust. Thank you, Esther. You have a good deal to share with us today, and we have a, a short one hour, so we'll start. Esther, you were born in Germany in 1937, several years after the Nazis took control of the country. Although you were too young to remember your life in Germany, can you tell us about your hometown of Adelsheim and your parents, Adolf and Katie Rosenfeld? I will. And I know information, some from my sisters, some from a researcher, Reinhard Lochmann, who lives in Adelsheim, and some from the Holocaust Museum, because you're right, I don't remember Germany. <laughs> And that. So my father's family had lived in that area over 200 years. It's in Baden in southern Germany. And my father was in the First World War. He had lost a leg in the First World War. So he couldn't practice being a baker, which is what he had trained to be. He instead sold grain from a cart. My mother, of course, helped him. My parents, my mother and my father, both came from families that had nine siblings. So they were big families. Unfortunately, I don't remember these, the people who didn't come to the United States. So Adelsheim is a very small place. There were 10 Jewish families. My parents had first lived in Korp, which is not far away from Adelsheim. And when the Jews in Korp had moved out, so there weren't enough people for a service, for a minion, my parents moved to Adelsheim. At that point, they had one daughter, and there was a somewhat bigger Jewish community there. You, um, you mentioned uh, they had one daughter at that time. You ended up having a total of uh, four siblings, so five children. Tell, tell us about your sisters and your brother, if you would. I would. Uh, my, the tallest one, my sister Bertel, was the oldest and as the Holocaust proceeded and things happened, she kind of was made the chief in charge of us. Uh, my sister Edie, the next one, joined the British Army. I'll talk about that later. My sister Ruth, my brother Herman, who was four years older than I, and that's my me sitting on my mother's lap and my father. Mm -hmm. So, um, when the Nazis started putting in their rules, my three older sisters could not go to public school. So they had been sent to Aachen, which is a couple of hundred miles away from Adelsheim. And they were living with two of my mother's sisters at that time. And then Herman and I were still at home. Esther, you, you mentioned that um, both your, your parents had nine siblings each. Uh, so 18 aunts and uncles, you know, for you, um, or, or 16 plus parents, you, you must have had just uh, uh, lots of cousins, uh, even though you're too young to remember them, but you must have had such a large extended family. I think we did. I mean, two, two families came to the, issue, the United States. So I had two cousins here, and then I had an aunt who had come here much earlier, so I had that cousin and one other cousin that was in London. Unfortunately, many of my cousins didn't survive. Right. 
and as you mentioned, um, uh, your because your sisters were not allowed to go to public school because of the, the Nazi uh, restrictions on Jews, so they end up going a couple hundred miles away in Aachen. So, just a year and a half after you were born, on November 9th through tenth, nineteen thirty-eight, the Nazis attacked Jews in a wave of nationwide pogroms or violent attacks. These events became known as Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass because of the shattered glass on the streets after the vandalism and destruction of Jewish owned businesses, synagogues, and homes. <clears throat> At the time with your sisters in Aachen, um, you and your brother are still with your parents in Adelsheim. Will, will you tell us about the impact that Kristallnacht had on your family? I will. First, let me talk about my sisters. Unlike today, where information wasn't immediate, my sisters, according to them, started out for school on the 10th and saw the synagogue burning and were told to go back home. This is the synagogue in Adelsheim, in Aachen. And they went back home. Now, in Adelsheim, Reinhardt, the historian that I talked about earlier, told me people came from other villages and some people from Adelsheim joined in. They set the synagogue in Adelsheim on fire. They took the Torahs, the holy books, out and burned them. They also arrested some of the men that were there. Luckily, my parents' house wasn't on the main street. Not that there were a lot of streets, but there wasn't right mm -hmm. there, so my parents were all right. And Again, this is what I've learned, not that I remembered it at all. My sisters, other than telling me they went home, didn't actually talk about what happened to them. So they, they didn't later describe what they saw and witnessed um, uh, at that time because they were older. Well, they didn't talk about much. Yeah. I mean, a couple of basic stories. They told me that there used to be people in my aunt's house at night and they were gone in the morning. So presumably my aunts were helping people to escape from Germany. And they they really didn't talk about their experience, at least not to me. Maybe they talked to each other. You, you mentioned a moment ago, Esther, uh, uh, Reinhard Lachmann, and that he is a researcher who uh, you've learned a great deal, you know, subsequent in, in even in recent years from Reinhardt. Just tell us a little bit more about how he came to know so much about what happened to the Jews of Adelsheim. So originally there was a man in Adelsheim who knew my parents. And when the Jewish families would write back, would answer them. Mr. Wedderhan. In fact, my sister Edie, when she was in the British Army and went to get birth certificates, met him on the street and he looked at her and said, do this to Adolf's daughter. He knew exactly mm. who he was, but he got too old for it. So he gave it over to Reinhard Lockman, who was a teacher in the local school. And Reinhardt had an after school club that did research because you used to ask me questions and I would say, Bill, why do you think I would know that? <laughs> and I would email Reinhardt and he would find out. I mean, among other things, Reinhardt has made a family tree for us. It goes back three or four generations. Unfortunately, I haven't heard stories about most of those people, so I don't know anything about them. But it also tells what happened to all these people. Now, my mother's sisters, a lot of them, siblings were older, and a lot of them died before the Holocaust. But then the younger ones, it talks about what camps they were in and their kids and all that. So we do know that. And my, my brother's siblings, several were in this country, but I do know what happened to the others. I, I think it's sad that I don't really know anything about these people. Oh, of course. Incredibly sad. Absolutely. Esther, before we continue, I'd like to let you know that there are people uh, watching and listening to you today from all over the place. So I'd like to welcome our guests that are watching from around the U.S., in Missouri, Oregon, Connecticut, Texas, and Idaho, as well as the viewers we have watching from other places in the world, like today from Malta, Argentina, and South Africa. So thanks to everybody for joining us. And I'd also like to share a comment with you, Esther, uh, shared by a viewer named Veronica. Veronica writes, 
I had the privilege to talk with this amazing lady on my visit to the Holocaust M Museum last April. It was a really short conversation, but it left a mark in my heart. Nothing but respect for her and all. That's nice. What a lovely comment. That, that, re that really, really is. Well, sometimes um, when you sit there and talk to people, you wonder if it's having any impact and that it's nice to know it is. Not only uh, did you have impact on her then and there, but now she's following up and, and watching. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Veronica. Esther, following the events of Kristallnacht, your parents, along with many other German Jews, were convinced that life under the Nazis had become intolerable and could get even more dangerous. Your parents then made the most difficult decision imaginable, I think, to send their daughters on a kinder transport to England in 1939. Please tell us about these efforts to rescue children and how it was possible for your sisters and then you to leave Germany. Well, after Kristallnacht in England, the Jewish community, the Quakers and other faith communities went to parliament to ask if children could be brought to England to save them. And parliament said, yes, the children had to travel unaccompanied and there was a 50 pound fee, which is more than $2,000 now, because they didn't want the children to stay in England when they grew up and take jobs away from English people. And the Jewish community in England sent people over to Germany to work with the Jewish community there. And of course with the Nazis, but this was before they were trying to kill all the Jews. They just wanted them gone. Mm -hmm. it worked. So Kristallnacht was November 9th and 10th and December 3rd, the first kinder transport reached England, which was pretty quick, I think. Less than a month. Yeah. Yeah. And from what I understand, originally the plan was to try and get kids out whose parents would not be able to take care of them or to leave. So, as I said <clears throat> earlier, my parents, my sisters were in Aachen, and they were sent March of 1939. Of course, not like today, you can't just hop in the car and drive a couple of hours. They didn't get to say goodbye. But my mother had another sister, Aunt Hannah, who had gone to England earlier as a refugee immigrant. And she worked in the London area as a maid, so she knew a lot of people. And she arranged jobs for my, uh, jobs, I'm sorry, housing for my sisters. Now, Bertel went with a couple that took her to Scotland. And about a year and a half later, when she was 16, she came back to live with my aunt and to work. And at some point after she was back in London, the police came to the door and asked if she knew this man. Turned out her foster father was actually a spy for the Germans. What a great cover. Um, Bert, Edie lived with a family in London, a non-Jewish family, and Ruth was with a Jewish doctor and their family. But once the heavy bombing started in London, Edie and Ruth were sent to other places. And... Edie always felt they didn't treat her very well, but she was a teenager and teenagers complain, I think. And Ruth stayed for a while with the family and then she was in a hostel. And the only thing she ever said was because she wouldn't do the Jewish lessons that were sent to her. I don't know if that's really why she was moved. I, I just have to repeat something you said, and that is that then Bertel went to Scotland to live with his family. And it turns out that the the, the man of the house was later found out to be spying for the Germans. And so, as you said, the, the most extraordinary cover to welcome into your home a Jewish child while you're actually a spy for the Nazis. That's uh, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. So, Esther, in, in June 1939, just shortly after your second birthday, you then left um, on a kinder transport and arrived in London several months after your sister. What what do you know of what happened once you landed in, in England? Well, first of all, let me tell you about the tag I was wearing. This is what I was wearing. It has my name. And you'll notice it says Sarah. The Nazis added Sarah to all Jewish women's names and 
Israel to all male names, another way of identifying and separating us. What I know is I was met by a Quaker lady who by train took me to Norwich. And my foster mother, Auntie Dot, had a letter from Mrs. Eddington telling them when the train would get into Norwich, would they be able to meet me? I don't really remember if they met me. I don't know. And the interesting, other interesting thing about this letter, it said my father was from Berlin, which wasn't true, and that he was very prosperous. And it clearly wasn't true. He had a business two months before I was born. But I was lived with the Harrisons, who were my foster family. Esther, uh, Norwich, was Norwich um, uh, a good ways outside of London or just a suburb of London? Oh, no, it's not near London. It's over 100 miles away. Oh, so a good long distance. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. cathedral city and a market city in that, though actually the Harrisons lived outside in it wasn't even suburban. It was outside of Norwich. Yeah. So, so even outside the little town of Norwich. Yeah. So Norwich is not a little town. It's a real town. All right. So Esther, you, of course, once you got to the Harrisons and um, you, you met your brother, your foster brother, um, mm -hmm. Alan, who right. was seven years older than you. And years later, and here we see you with, um, with uh, both the, uh, the Harrisons and their son, Alan, in this picture. Right. And that this is in their backyard. They had a, a, a big backyard, which was why people lived out there. And they grew vegetables. They had chickens. I thought the rats got them because they disappeared. But Alan said no, so I guess we ate them. And that I was very happy with them. They were very fundamentalist Christians. I went to chapel with them. What else do you do when you're two years old? I mean, I don't really think they were trying to convert me, but they weren't connected to the Jewish community, so I wasn't involved in that. But Mr. Let's, let's hear from Alan, who later in life reflected on his first memories of your arrival in at their home, and he did this in an interview. So let's hear directly from Alan in this video. Esther must have been the very... My, almost the youngest on the ship, I would imagine. But anyhow, sort of tea time, this little girl arrives. She was a bit weepy, I should say. And uh, when she came into the house or into the bungalow, maybe it was because she was used to having a brother, Herman, who was about the same age as me, but she took my hand and kind of wandered around the house, you know. It's, a, it's wonderful to have that that bit of an interview with Alan, and we'll we'll hear from him again a little bit later. Can you tell us a little bit more about your time in those early years um, with the Harrisons? Um, as you said, you you went to chapel with them. Uh, you were you were just part of their daily life in this uh, place they lived. Yeah, and I didn't really remember Germany. I mean, they didn't know my parents, so they couldn't talk to me and make, help me remember it. Um, I went in June. The war started in September, so we carried gas masks. They had a bomb shelter in the backyard. There was an American air base nearby, so there were planes flying over. And that. what Alan told me as an adult, they used to, he and his buddies would try and get the scrapple and stuff that fell off the planes and that, but I didn't know that at the time. Right, right. I was very happy there. I, I enjoyed school once I went, and Alan tells me I was very competitive. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> and that I had friends in the neighborhood. It was, it was a lovely time. Mm -hmm. In the summer, when I, once Alan was old enough, he worked in farms in the summer. Auntie Dot and I would ride our bikes out and take him lunch. I mean, now I can't even get on a bike, and to think we would ride several miles—it's hard to believe that. Those, those, those are—I'm sure, among all the other things that occurred for you and your family, that that are those are good memories. That part of it. 
I had a very happy childhood. I was very happy. They were very protective of me. I mean, they got a newspaper, but I don't remember reading it. I could read very early. And um, they had a radio, but unlike today, they turned on the radio to listen to the news and turned it off. People didn't leave those things on all day long. <laughs> and that, so I don't know. I mean, I clearly knew there was a war because there was bombing and all this. I don't think I connected it so much as to what was happening to my family. Right. Esther, in, in the beginning of your time with the Harrisons, your parents were in touch through a series of letters. In one of your mother's letters, she shares how appreciative she is of Mrs. Harris, Harrison, and she focuses on how you are transitioning to life in England. Would you mind reading your mother's letter to us? Yes, and I had these letters because my foster mother kept everything and gave them to me as an adult. Wow. And this is a translation by somebody else, because I don't read German. Uh, Dear Mrs. Harrison, thank you so much for your kind letter and the postcard of the young lady. Now we are much more reassured as we know that our little Esther is better, and we do hope that she will be soon all right again. I can realize that it is not easy for you until Esther is accustomed to you. As the little girl clung to her mother so very much, though she is not spoiled at all, conditions were here such that she couldn't go to anybody else. Esther is a merry child, loves playing with other children. I hope her sisters will be able to come and see her and fetch some clothes. I am so glad that Esther likes your son, and by God's keep, she will soon become accustomed to you. It will also take a little time until she has lost homesickness. We suffer from it too. But it is more difficult for the little one as she cannot make herself understood. Be patient and she will get over it. The great thing is that she keeps well for we are devoted to her. May God keep her well in a strange land. We had to part because we wished for the good of our children and believe that only the hope of seeing them again makes us strong and helps us to overcome. Now I thank you and the young lady who was so kind as to translate our letter. I would have written to her, but have lost her address. Once again, many thanks for the love and kindness and care that Esther enjoys with you and a kiss for our darling. Yours gratefully, Kati Rosenfeld. I know Esther that that is a precious item to you and that thank goodness dot uh harrison hung on to it it's it's every word in it is 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 poignant and profound but i just have to repeat um in particular this line quote we had to part because we wished for the good of our children and believe that only the hope of seeing them again makes us strong and helps us to overcome Clearly, at the time, your your mother and your father had hoped that they would again be reunited with you. And what that doesn't answer is why didn't they send Herman? My yeah. brother didn't go on a kinder transport, so um, why was he was away at school, but very close? Was it because he was the only boy? Did he have a cold that week? except I had scarlet fever when I got to England. So mm -hmm. something I don't think we'll ever know. But I know my niece thinks it's because the kinder transport didn't take boys, and that's not true. Right. So it's a big puzzle, something. Why, why they, they didn't send them at that time. And, you, and, of course, you're never going to know the answer to that, I don't believe. Yeah. Esther, right. I'd like to share with you some comments um, uh, from our audience. And before I do, I'd like to... Uh, urge our audience, please send any questions you have for Esther via the chat feature. Um, you'll be uh, very pleased to know that your daughter, Deborah, and nieces, Tamar and Anne are also watching and they say hello to you. Oh, good. And, and I'd like to say hello to them, too. Uh, I'd also like to share a comment from Janice. Janice writes, my mother got sent on the kinder transport at the age of five. It's impossible to imagine having to send your small child away to live with strangers, 
not knowing if you would ever see them again. It is hard to know how parents were brave enough to do that. Esther, um, what can you, as you mentioned, you, you don't you don't know the reason why Herman was not able to go at the same time that you went. What what can you tell us about the conditions for your parents and your brother Herman? for them in Germany after you and your sisters were gone? What do you know about that time? Well, I know they couldn't get food. I know there was a lot of discrimination and nasty stuff happening to Jews. As I said before, my father had lost his business. So he, and, and I want to reiterate, it wasn't a big business. He sold grain to farmers and arranged mm -hmm. trades of cows or a horse. So how were they living? It's hard to figure it out. Uh, one time, Bertel and one of my brother's daughters were in Adelsheim for a ceremony marking the deportation of the Jews from that area. And we met a couple of people who said their families used to help my parents. One man told us his father would put food on their doorstep at night so they had food, but that his wife was very upset by it because she was afraid something would happen to them because of it. And another person mentioned that his family were trading artifacts and getting giving them food. And I said to Bertel, do you think this is true? And she said, yeah, she had letters where our parents had mentioned it. So I think just the daily trying to stay alive was really hard. And I can't imagine, I mean, I was two, so Herman was six, six, seven, that age, what it was like for a little kid to be in a place where people like him were being discriminated, couldn't do the normal things, couldn't go to school with the neighbors. I, I just can't imagine what it was like. And my brother would never talk about anything that happened to him. Esther, so, at some point, however, your mother, father, and your brother were rounded up and sent to a camp. That's true. On Sukkot of 1940, because many actions against Jewish people were on Jewish holidays, all the people in Baden were told to report to their town center. They could have one suitcase and enough supplies for three days journey. And they were sent to Gurs, which was a camp in uh, France. It was pretty bad play. I mean, all camps were bad, but there was a lot of disease here. There wasn't enough food. There wasn't enough shelter. And even though both my parents were there, men and women were in different barracks, so they weren't together. And unfortunately, my father's leg wasn't sent with him, so he wasn't his fake leg. He wasn't very mobile. Now, the the mayor of um, Adelsheim got the orthopedic place to send it to him. So it was not a good place to be. Now in France, there was a group called Ose that took children out of the camps. They housed them, they fed them, they educated them. And in 1941, they were managed to bring a thousand children to the United States. And a lot of what we know comes from a picture that the Holocaust Museum found when they were, this picture, when they were doing the research for what the Americans knew. And also, uh, I have met through the museum, a young woman, Lily Meyer, who has written a book about one of these other children. So when she did research, she found out things about Herman and what happened to him, which has made it possible for his children to find out some other information. What's really interesting, all three of his daughters say he would not be happy that they knew this. But of all my siblings, he really had the worst time because when he was little, his sisters disappeared. He was in this camp. He came to the United States. And when he first got here, he knew he had family here, but nobody knew exactly where they were. So he was in a home in New York and there was a picture in a New York paper about him and some distant cousin saw it and recognized the name. And that's how he got connected to an aunt and uncle in Washington, D.C. So he came to Washington, D.C. 
and he lived with an aunt and uncle here. And he called them mom and dad, and their son was his brother. And in fact, once he was married and had children, his kids did not know they weren't his real parents. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other cousins knew and would have told them. Cousins do those things, but they would have figured it out. So, so he, your your brother had been in Gurs, and I believe another, uh, maybe another yes. camp with your parents, and and um, was able to get out on this ship. It's remarkable um, that that was relatively recently that that exhibit took place. So, your knowledge about Herman on that ship is is very new in the scheme of I things. Mean, I mean, we were so excited to get this because we didn't exactly know how he had gotten here. And, um, you know, maybe my aunt and uncle knew more, but they didn't talk about it. I mean, it's hard to think. Nowadays, people talk about everything. There's nothing that doesn't get talked about. But it was in the way. I mean, my uncle, the uncle he lived with, had originally lived in Ardlesheim, so he probably didn't know him, whether he remembered him. I don't know. But they were just immigrants trying to make a living in a new world. They weren't going to talk about the old world. And of course, during the war, it was best not to spread the word that you were German. Yeah. I think. Esther, your, your parents ended up being in more than one camp. Did, did you or your sisters hear from your parents while they were in these camps? Yeah. Bertel was, was writing to them. Bertel by then was living with Aunt Hannah, my mother's sister. So my parents would write to Bertel and Aunt Hannah. And um, in the 80s, when there was a lot of information about the Holocaust on TV, Bertel said, oh, she had a, some letters that she'd managed to save. So it's five letters. My mother basically wrote these letters. My father wrote two lines underneath. But it was very interesting. I mean, my mother, who was in a terrible place, she'd lost her children. She was in this camp. And she still believed God, family, and friends would take care of us, which, of course, is what happened. And um, she told Bertel to do a lot of things. Bertel was supposed to make sure we thanked the people taking care of us, studied hard, cleaned behind our ears, all the things mothers say. There was no way Bertel could do that. We were all in different parts of England, so she couldn't do that. And she also, uh, in one letter, she told Bertel, to keep the clothes she'd outgrown because she would be able to wear them. She was so slim. If you remember from the family picture, my mother was not a slim person. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that point, they still thought they would get out, which they couldn't. Um, so at some point, my mother knew where Herman was, that he was in this home, and then she knew he was in the United States. But she tells Bertel to make sure Bertel keeps us together as a family and that we needed to come to the United States where my father's siblings were and my brother was. And my sister Bertel, as I said earlier, she sort of became in charge of us, sort of the kind of mother, but not really mother. But she likes to tell us what to do. And um, Bertel had no gray in her life. She was told to do something, so she did it. And, and, her, and, your, and your mother told her she had to you know, take care of all of you despite the circumstances. Yeah. But that So those, those letters that your mother wrote, you did not know about for years until the 1980s. What, what was it like for you to realize that you now had letters that your mother had written um, at that point? Well, my husband had them translated. It's really all I know about my mother. Right. My father... I know more about because Reinhardt, he lived in that area and Reinhardt did a lot of research. In fact, after Bertel died, I thought she never told me stories about our mother. And I wish I'd asked her before she died. Why not? Right. But it was so interesting to me to think of the strength of these two people that I absolutely don't remember had to send us all away. I mean, they had to sign for Herman to leave too. And to believe that people would take care of us, I just, I don't know if I were in that circumstance, if I could still believe there was a God and that God would take care of us. I just, I, I cannot imagine the strength of it. 
And I, I, my younger grandson took a class in Holocaust in college, and he wrote a paper about my mother mothering from the camp mm -hmm. and had all kinds of things in the letters. But I was so I was glad to get them. I wish Bertel had managed to save some other ones, but whatever. Um, a couple of them are quite dated, so don't know exactly when they were written. But you, but I do know by the end they knew they were not going to get out. And actually, my father would never have been allowed in this country because of his wooden leg, which I didn't realize till wow. one of my buddies at the museum told me that. And Esther, one of our viewers is has posed the question, man. What, what happened to your parents? And her name, this this viewer's name, Mo, is asking that. My parents went from Gers to Reeves Salz, and then they went to Drancy, which was the transit camp, to Auschwitz. And they arrived in Auschwitz, August 14th, 1942, and they were murdered upon their arrival. And We've known this two ways for a long time. Bertel got letters back that she had been writing to them. And then there's a, a book that French people had written and it lists all the trans, all the transits to Auschwitz, who was on them, all the information, their birthdays, where they lived, everything about them and when they got there and what happened to them. And of course, now a lot of records are available. So even if we didn't have that, we could check it out. But that is what happened to my parents. Mm -hmm. Thanks thanks for sharing that with us, Esther. Well, well, of course, you wouldn't know what actually did happen to your parents until much later. Um, you remained with the Harrisons throughout the war, until the war and beyond. Do you recall, um, as uh, in the latter part of the war years, as you got older, um, do you recall what daily life was like? Did it just remain the same because it was still wartime? It seemed to me it remained pretty yeah. much. I love the letter to, from my mother who says I wasn't spoiled. The Harrisons spoiled me. I was spoiled. <laughs> from the Harrisons. Yeah. And one other thing, I, I don't know if I mentioned it before, the interview with Alan, he still lives in Norwich. I mean, he sounds very English. He is very English, but he is still there. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Alan in a, in a couple of minutes. But yes, he definitely sounds very, very English. Um, while while you were with the Harrisons and your sisters were in very different places, first Bertel in Scotland, then back with your Aunt Anna and your other sisters elsewhere, during that time, do you know if you were able to see your sisters? Could they visit you? Did you visit them? They did visit. The Harrisons okay. were very welcome. I mean, they included my sisters in their family. This is um, Bertel with the scarf on and Edie is behind Alan. I don't know if that's Ruth in the back, but behind Bertel is Auntie Dot. And I'm wearing a dress one of my aunts made for me. Hmm. But... My sister, it was easier to travel after the war because it was hard for everybody to travel during the war and for German refugees, probably even harder. One time Aunt Hannah came down and there was a lot of tension between Auntie Dot and Aunt Hannah. I mean, they were very different people. One of the times Bertel came down, Aunt Hannah was kosher. She followed the strict laws. Bertel got a live chicken from someone and took it back in a box on the train so Aunt Hannah could have it killed in a way that made it kosher. And one time we did go, and I can't remember if one of my sisters came and got me or any doctor, went to London and I went to a Seder from one of the people that Aunt Hannah worked for. I didn't know enough about it to really know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember if it was that time or some other time we were in London. Alan and I went up and down the escalators in Harrods because we didn't have them in Norwich. We had to enjoy these things. When we and, were and, and again, and those 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 fleeting memories must really be um, just important to hang on to about those kinds of uh, joyful moments that you experienced. Yeah. yeah. You World War Two, of course, ended in Europe in May 1945. And it would be another two and a half years, 1947, when your family was able to make arrangements for you and your sisters to 
come to the United States, by that time you had lived with the Harrisons for eight years and they certainly wished that you were able to stay with them. Um, Alan, Alan reflected on the day that you had to leave. So let's go ahead and hear from Alan again. Well, of course, that was the most terrible day for my mother and me. Eventually, my, my parents knew that Esther was going to leave with Berthel, and they accepted that. And on November the 5th, 1947, I was going to get the Lord Mayor's Prize for History, but the head gave me permission to miss school and go to Southampton. Esther went on the boat train from London to Southampton, and of course, I do remember only too well seeing them on board the old Queen Mary, trying to say goodbye or God bless and so on. It was a very long time before my mother could sort of get over it, really. Esther, you were, you were with the Harrisons eight years, eight of your first 10, I believe, so 80% of your life at that point. Can you share with us what you re recall of your feelings were like about leaving the Harrisons? I can. I mean, they were very English. We didn't talk about this stuff. I mean, they knew I was going to leave and I knew they weren't my parents. On the other hand, we never really talked about it. That picture of me in front of a fence is a picture where I'm with a big feeder. And Auntie Dot had given it to me, and I never really turned it over. I flipped it over a couple of years ago, and it says, in London, to see if there's room on a ship for Esther to leave. You know, you, it's very English, or at least that part of England, not to talk about that stuff. And um, I know Bloomsbury House, which was the organization that looked after us, had asked the minister of the chapel to teach me Hebrew, so they definitely wanted me to know about Judaism. I didn't learn any, I'm bad at languages. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it just wasn't on our minds. I clearly, I had signed a um, travel document. It's not a passport, but it's a travel document. I'm not stupid. I knew if I'm <laughs> signing a travel document, I'm leaving. What happened, I mean, Alan was talking about taking, going to London. Before that, the Harrisons didn't have a phone. I mean, most people didn't have phones then. Right. Bertle called the police in, Nari, in Thorpe to come and knock on the door and tell them they had to leave and take me to London. I mean, can you imagine having the police come and tell you that? I mean, it, it, and I'm sure it happened with other kinder. Yeah, and, Apparently, there were 200 kinder in, in Norwich, in East Anglia, in that area. But I didn't know any of them. I might 200 not. other kids had come over on kinder transports? We're in Maybe. that area. But I, area. Okay. So I don't know. The Harrisons never talked about it. I don't know. I don't think Alan, he said there weren't any other Jewish kids in his class, so he didn't know them. So it... it I, it, I was happy, and the Harrisons were wonderful people. But there was so much I didn't know what was happening around me. And it's hard now because kids know everything. With social media and television, it's hard to keep things from children now. But it was much easier then right. to do that. I mean, it was. I was trying to explain that to some kids at the museum the other day, and they just kind of looked at me like, whatever. <laughs> but it it was such a different time when we protected kids more. Yeah. And Esther, then you, you said your goodbyes, you left for the United States in 1947. What can you tell us about your early transition to an entirely new life in the United States? Well, I wasn't happy to leave because when you're 10, you have no choices. Uh, the Harrisons were my family. I didn't remember my parents. And while Bertel and Edith and Ruth had visited, I had never really lived with them when I was old enough to get a sister closeness. And we came to the United States and two of our uncles met us. 
and came down to Washington, D.C., and we lived with a different aunt and uncle than Herman. I didn't remember Herman, truthfully. And living with my aunt and uncle, to me, was awful. I had lived in thought in the country with people who never raised their voices in a little house. And we lived in a big house on a major street in Washington, D.C. There was my aunt, her mother, my uncle, two cousins, another refugee family, and us. My uncle threw furniture. My aunt was mentally ill before there was medicine for it. One of my cousins was a bully. I had no idea how to deal with that. I wasn't close enough to my sisters that I could tell them. So for me, it was pretty awful. Now, I started school um, in sixth grade, which was elementary then. The teacher made fun of my English, but as a kid, that was awful. As an adult, I know it was just she wasn't happy to have immigrants in her class. Mm -hmm. and, um, then I went to junior high then. My uncle decided I should take Spanish. I wanted to take Latin, but he said Spanish. And I thought, oh, he thinks the Spanish teacher is cute. But that really wasn't it. The, the Spanish teacher was Jewish. There were two other Jewish kids in the class. And she took us under our wing. We ate lunch with her sometimes. And it was a chance to talk about that. I mean, she was a mentor before mentoring was invented. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Bert, Edith, and Ruth, no, Bert, Ruth, and I came over in 47. Edith was still in the British Army, so she came a year later. And once Bert and Edith had jobs, they got an apartment. Luckily, they took me with them. It never occurred to me they wouldn't, but they were young people in a new country trying to make a new life. I mean, it was pretty nice of them to take me with them. Of course, maybe my uncle and aunt said they had to. I don't know. And uh, Ruth went to college. Back then, you could work at the college, earn your room board and tuition, and she got married while she was still in college. So we were all here. Esther, we have a, along those lines that you're, you're starting to discuss, we have a, a, a question on video from um, a viewer um, named a scholar. Uh, she's a student in Washington, D.C. So let's go ahead and hear Scholar's question of you. Hi, my name is Scholar Blango and I live in Washington, D.C. How did being separated from your siblings impact your relationships? Scholar is asking you is how did being separated from your siblings, from your your sisters, how did and your brother, how did that impact your relationship? Quite a bit. I mean, I didn't I, I think when siblings live together, they develop some friendship, some enemyship. <laughs> they they it's all part of their life and their history. So that part of my history wasn't here. And of course the fact that we weren't with our parents, I mean, maybe my sisters remembered traditions for holidays and things. I didn't know that. It wasn't anything we developed together about how you go about celebrating life or what kind of, how you react to each other. I mean, we did eventually become a very close family and very close. But as I said earlier, my sister Bertel was more a mother, not quite a mother figure, but sort of a mother mm -hmm. figure. And that, I mean, I have written, we have a memoir writing group, and I, I once wrote, because somebody was reading about all the things their mother did for them to make their childhood happy, and I wrote about all the mothers I had, because I had my mother, who taught me to believe in God and to believe people were good, and my sister Bertel, who taught me a lot of other stuff, and then I lived with Ruth and David in college, so I had a lot of people that acted as mothers. Or, or did the mother roll? Right. right. The mother was consistent, but yes. This is a lovely photograph. Tell us about it. Uh, this was my sister Edie's wedding. Um, and this was in Capitol Heights, Maryland. She, Her wedding, the celebration was in the firehouse. My aunt had a frozen custard store in Capitol Heights, my aunt and uncle. And each of us had a favorite aunt and uncle, and Aunt Sophie and Uncle Jim were Edith's favorites. 
And um, I don't remember where the ceremony actually was. And this was my first year at college. So Ruth and I had come from Illinois where we were living. And Berta, we looked like a typical American family. Unfortunately, Edith's wedding marriage didn't last, but otherwise, which is probably typically American too. <laughs> and that. And I just I think we just look like typical American family. It's interesting to see what was stylish back then. Yeah. Esther, we have a, a question from another viewer, Rosa. And um, and she asks, did you stay in contact with the Harrison family? Absolutely. Bertel and Edie made sure I wrote when we came here. And when I got to go to college, which would not have happened in Germany. And when I graduated from college, I went to spend the summer mostly with Auntie Dot, with Aunt Hannah. But then I did visit uh, the Harrisons. This was me that year, 1957. And Alan and I actually took a short trip to Paris together, which my Aunt Hannah was scandalized about. But we had a good time. I bought yellow shoes. My yellow shoes were my favorite shoes for years. And, that, and then once I was married and we had kids, Fred and Deborah and Judy, we used to go visit pretty regularly. And often we went and we would go on a trip with Alan. We went to Scotland. We went to Wales. Uh, we went to Ireland, but that was after Deborah and Judy were grown. And Alan came to the United States as a exchange teacher one year. And at the end of his year, we brought the Harrisons over to visit, which was really very special. And that we, we got a place at, a, at the beach, which had thousands of mosquitoes. Alan found it was a terrible place, but we had fun. And, that, and then... Once Auntie Dot died, Uncle Harry used to come and visit Fred and I for six weeks in the summer. He loved coming to Washington. He loved going to synagogue with Fred and to the Brotherhood. And that, you know, he did used to plant vegetables in my flower gardens, but that wasn't so good. But once Uncle Harry died, Alan found out from one of his cousins that his father, Uncle Harry's father, was actually Jewish. He had come from... Ukraine, Russia, you know, that those places that change names periodically. He was a well-known photographer and had married Alan's um, grandmother. And they had two children. And then his grandfather left, went back to where we came from and left his grandmother in the poorhouse with these two children, one of which was Alan's father. I mean, I assume his grandfather had another family where he came from. I, I don't think that was unusual. We've done a little research on it. And Esther, this photo, this photo is you and Alan, but this is uh, from probably um, right, right at the close of the war that at time, right? Right. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Esther, I'd like to share a question and a comment from Rachel. Uh, Rachel says, writes, hello, Esther. I was wondering if you grew up doing anything special to honor your parents. Have you made traditions over the years to keep them close? Thank you so much for being willing to talk about your story. I haven't actually done anything. On the other hand, I'm the person in our family who has found out a great deal, has records about our family and has put it all together. Um, I don't know who's going to want it when I'm gone, but I have a lot of information. I do honor them at my synagogue when it's their anniversary of their death, which is traditional. As far as actual traditions, no, because I don't really remember them. I talk about them. I talk about them a great deal. Programs like this, I've written about them. Um, when I'm speaking at uh, the Holocaust Museum, I volunteer every Monday I talk about them and the sacrifice they made, but it's hard for me to put flesh on what they were like. Uh, what I know is from the letters. Right. And, that, and I, I talked about that today, but I, I don't know how they met. I don't know what they did for holidays, if they were close to their family. I don't know any of that. And, my sisters never talked about it that much. And um, 
Reinhardt does, or he did, he has to, um, Alzheimer's or dementia now, he went to the cemetery, the Jewish cemetery that was between Adelsheim and Senfeld, and he made sure the um, it was up, kept up. And he, as is the Jewish his Jewish custom, put stones that he visited to relatives mm -hmm. that were there. And he, there is a book about the Jews in Rexingham, which is where my mother came from. And we had a lot of family there. Again, that cemetery is kept up. In that so, but as far as knowing enough about them personally to try and make a tradition, you know, a Passover, did they always do this? Who knows? I mean, the other thing that I would love to have known were what diseases. I mean, one of my daughters had severe kidney stuff. It would have been nice to know if there was some history to sort of been prepared. You don't know any of the family health history as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Esther, I um, I just have one last question for you before we close today, and that is, um, as we face a, a dangerous surge in anti-Semitism, please tell us what we can learn from your firsthand account of the Holocaust. I, I think what we can learn is how important it is to really learn the history, not just 33 to 45, what led up to it, what happened after First World War, it didn't just happen. There were steps to it. And to know this stuff so that we can pay attention to what's happening in the world today while there's a rise in anti-Semitism, from anti-Semitism it goes to anti-everything else. I mean, I, I think it is so important for us to get involved in the politics of what's happening in our country or whatever country you live in. If we don't get involved at the beginning, once it's ramped up, it's hard to do anything about it. But we also need to talk to people and let them know what our lives, what it means to be Jewish, how it affects how we live. But we need to listen to other people too and learn about them. And we need to really talk more. We can't just shake our heads and say it's awful. It's there. So what do we do to help prevent it from spreading anymore? Esther, th thank you for that. Thank you for uh, your willingness to share this time with us to be our first person today. We don't have time in first person to talk about um, your life, of course, you know, after you came to the United States, much after that. But I, I want our audience to know that you had a tremendous career as an educator uh, and a teacher. And I think that comes across that, that um, you're just a teacher and uh, you've got a lot to share. And so um, thank you for doing that for us today and particularly helping to get a glimpse of all the upheaval that you and your sisters went through and remarkable transitions. And, and, and we are so glad you ended up here in the United States with us and that you're here with us for first person. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for letting me to share. And just one last thing. I think the ripple effect, this affected me, but look how many other people it affected. Yes. Certainly Alan's family, the kids I taught. And I think that's true with anything that happens. Nobody is isolated. And that really way. important point. Thank you, Esther. Thank you so much. I would like to take a moment, if I could, to thank our donor, First Person is made possible through generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. And I'd also like to invite you to join us again next month for another First Person program. So thank you, everybody, for being with us today. And most especially, thank you, Esther Starabin. <laughs>